My name is Larry Carvalho. Um, I, I have my own uh, analyst firm called Robust Cloud, and with me I have three panelists um, that will just introduce themselves in a minute. What we are here to talk about is the business value of cloud native solutions. Um, you know what I hear um, from from CIOs, from you know other folks who are more on the business side. They say, "Hey, we we understand technology, but what's the business value?" I I I don't know about can't talk about latency and this and that. I, I just need to know more of the business value. What we're going to attempt to do over here today is to give you that approach of reaching out to your business and getting the funding that you need when you're going in for a cloud native solution. So with that, I will um, start with you know, our panelists introducing themselves. Uh, start with Betty. Hello. Hi, I'm Betty Janad. I run product marketing for VMware Tanzu, which is the Kubernetes side of our um, portfolio. And let's see, I'm a longtime cloud native person. Um, have spent time at Docker as well as um, in so uh, Service Mesh and now at VMware. So really excited to talk to you about this today and really kind of bringing forward, um, you know, once you start looking at how do you do this and what does it mean to justify this at an enterprise level? Like, how do you make that case? Because, you know, you're not going to show up with a list of projects, like the, you know, list of all the OSS projects, but translating that for the other people that may not be hands-on keyboard or deep in the um, projects in your organization. Great. Uh, Chris Rosen. So they got two Chris's here. I'm going to just f get the full name here. <laughs> right, Chris, left. Yeah, exactly. So I apologize for being named Chris and causing confusion. Uh, my name is Chris Rosen. I'm the Director of Product Management in IBM Cloud. I'm responsible for our Cloud Native PaaS and IBM Cloud Satellite, which is our answer to distributed cloud or local cloud as a service. I've been with IBM for over 22 years in a number of different roles. In this current stint, you know, like I said, it's really about working with our customers, helping them find the why of you know why we not need to leverage technology to help us be able to move fast and innovate and get that business value. So I'm really excited uh, to be here as part of this panel. I expect everyone in the audience to think of some hard questions. I'll deflect those to the other Chris. If you have any easy, uh, I'll take those. Thank you. Okay, first challenge <laughs> passed. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Floatner. I'm, <clears throat> I'm in product strategy in Cisco, and I'm in the ETNI part of Cisco, which you may have noticed from your Wi-Fi uh, login. It's, uh, it, it stands for Emerging Technology and Incubation. The, it's the part of Cisco that actually is trying to do a lot of software. It's emerging for Cisco in the sense that it's a new area uh, in software as opposed to just the, the, the bread and butter that used to be Cisco's, uh, or that is Cisco's foundation business. The, uh, I guess my history is, I, I came to Cisco through an acquisition of a company called Banzai Cloud. I used to be the CEO of that uh, company. And uh, what we did is actually a lot of technology to make cloud native stuff simple and accessible uh, for the masses. And, and in some part, this is actually still the mission in ETNI on the, on the cloud native uh, front, just to simplify it and make it accessible. Lots of great technology, but how can we get a lot of people to actually uh, adopt it and deploy it en masse? So, great. So that's it. So what, what we want to talk about is, again, not about the technology aspects of cloud native. What, what I, when I talk to some folks, and especially those who run IT or, or the business folks who talk to IT, they say, hey, you know, my IT department comes and says, hey, invest half a million or a million dollars on this. And why are we doing this? Because we are running out of uh, support or, you know, we have to just, he said, they say, why, why are we just doing it for that reason? Can we bring in a solution that actually I don't mind paying $2 million if you give me the kind of business value that will make me competitive in the market from a business standpoint. So what I asked our three panelists to come up with one use case that they have. Each of them have one use case. I'm sure they have a lot more use cases that they can, you know, they have. And we're going to start with Chris Flotner to talk about his use case and talk about the business benefits of his use case. So, Chris. 
That sounds good. Should yeah. I? You want to look it? at it? It's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I wonder what I wrote. <laughs> 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 so, um, I guess a lot of the technology in, 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 in technologies in cloud native are kind of a Swiss army knife of nature that you can apply them in lots of different ways. And in this particular story, actually, what I'd like to focus on is the value of the service mesh and some security layer that actually gives you a full lifecycle solution. And in this particular instance, there are lot, lots of digital transformation happening in various businesses, including financial and fintechs, et cetera. And these products fill an important niche, which is how do you actually take some legacy systems and incorporate it into your uh, forward-looking cloud-native solution, and, and how do you secure them? One of the things I'd like to highlight here that people often gloss over is in terms of the value of a service mesh, by the way, on this is the uh, Cisco Callisti product, the, um, is that it actually uh, enables enterprises to kind of decouple the development cycles of the various teams. So you can actually have a separate set of people working on the, the foundation layer, the operational layer, and, and then you, and you can have a number of applications teams that then focus on the various components. I think what we've seen in terms of value of these applications is that people can combine existing uh, solutions that might be legacy, non-cloud native, in a very simple way across clouds, across various deployment techniques on-prem um, into a holistic solution. The, it's also worth mentioning that kind of the heritage and, well, pretty much everybody in the cloud native space is lots of open source projects. I just highlighted a few that we actually uh, do inside uh, Cisco ETNI. The, some of these come from Bonsai Cloud, some of these come from various other Cisco efforts, but these are very much the core, uh, form the core part of the products that we deliver. And, you know, they, they really have two functions. One of them is, um, is actually enabling the ecosystem to, uh, you know, to converge the integration story around them, but it's also for the, the broader ecosystem to benefit from some of these components. And then the customer value that we sell to them is the simplicity of combining these things to form useful solutions at the, uh, uh, at the application and the foundation operational layers. So perhaps yep. that's it. When you look at this story primarily on the um, you know, financial and digital transformation, you see a, a lot of banks and others coming in to go to a cloud-native solution for a lot of reasons. Biggest examples are Capital One and others that you may have you know, heard of. So with that, we're going to go to the next um, Chris Rosen to talk about another fintech story um, on what you do. Sure. So What's fascinating to me is that at the end of the day, regardless of the industry that customers are in, when we go and talk to them, they really have the same set of challenges in some form or fashion. Number one is I need consistency, and that's consistency across my developers, across my operations teams, across environments, the reality that we all live in between hybrid cloud, distributed cloud, these are real challenges. How do I move that data? How do I ensure that you know, I've got common CI CD pipelines? Because all of that technology is going to drive and focus on innovation, enabling those teams to not only move faster, but also do so in a more secure manner. Because in, when you think about building in those checks throughout the entire pipeline, we're making it easier for developers to consume security guidelines that we put in place. Because, you know, at the end of the day, they want to align, but they don't want to become a CISO in their job. They want to really focus on innovation. That's what drives them as a developer. So we want to kind of mix both sides of that equation where we can interject the technology that helps them and enables them but also provides the guardrails to prevent them from making silly mistakes, deploying uh, code with vulnerabilities, violating open source guidelines. So it's building in those tools. And the other piece is around regardless of where I want to run. So this 
particular use case that I'm focused on was a, a fintech customer, a very large bank that I'm sure you're all familiar with, that you know, their problem statements were around, I want to run some of my workload in cloud, but the reality is not everything can or should run in public cloud yet. So how do I get that consistent, fully SRE managed capability in my data center, in my edge locations, which in this case are the, you know, the customer facing banks where they don't have Kubernetes or OpenShift or Tecton or Istio or so on and so forth expertise. So how can we provide those managed services? And when I think about a managed service, it's moving up that line of responsibility so that customer can focus on what's important to them because it's not these open source projects and all the things that we love digging into the weeds around the different open source projects and things that you know we're here to learn about all week. It's bringing in the managed capabilities so we can focus on innovation and delivering capabilities to our end consumers. In this example, it's, it's the banking customers. It's the people that are filling out mortgage applications. They want to deposit a check, something as simple as that. They want to be able to do that in a very secure and seamless manner. So the customer needed to be able to build and innovate in cloud, but also run those workloads consistently in their data centers or in those banking locations. So that's really what we're focused on is providing consistency, whether that's using OpenShift as the common platform that can run in our cloud, in other clouds, in your data center, and giving that very consistent CI CD pipeline automation controls to let the customer focus on building what's important to them. Good. So one thing I picked from this one is the sovereignty or data sovereignty, if you would. It is really important for, for uh, banks. And, and one of the business value that you can bring up is they can say, hey, do you need to go cloud native to do data sovereignty? No, you can still do it. But what is the difference in cost for doing it? with cloud native versus not cloud native. I think that's, if you can articulate that value, it's much more easy for somebody to understand that not just you go to cloud native, but you also get some additional value. With that, we'll start the next slide with Betty talking about a retailer. So it's a little different from the previous two. Yeah, so let me, a little refresher for all the things I wrote here, but um, <laughs> um, what's great about this use case here is that um, you know, when I was looking back at like some of the, the presentations and such that the customer had written to talk about their journey thus far, it starts off with like, hey, let me explain to you quickly our business. And then immediately they go to like, here's some like challenges, the, the immediate challenges we were facing. And then right after that was, here are our goals. So by orienting pretty specifically on what their first like, what is, what is ultimately do we need to achieve out of this first? And at that time, it was really related to like, we need better application performance. We need to make things easier to maintain because things were like, you know, just upgrading the, their primary app was difficult, right? So they had some very clear principles on like which goals that they were targeting. And then they focused it on the first app, one app. So I think that really helped them kind of go through this journey of becoming cloud native. They took that in phases. So there it's, this is like a four part uh, journey in that, you know, I only listed six projects here, but it is like, if I were to actually list all the logos, I would need a whole separate slide. <laughs> but what they did is at each stage, they were able to go and focus on, let me adopt a few of these things. Cause first thing I'm going to solve for is the fact that, um, you know, everything's takes too long. So I, what I want to do is make sure that we do automation. Right. I want to make sure that, um, we build in some automation so that provisioning the environments goes much faster or now I can do so that do some things to automate the developer workflow. So they focus on a couple of projects, get some of those things in, learn, and then they would go to the next stage to bring in some more, um, to bring in some more technologies like adding, um, adding more configurations and other things into the cluster, more technologies into the cluster. And what's surprising is that um, around stage, I think it was like their third stage, what they found is that, hey, now we actually need to go back and do this other work around costing because all the work that we did, because we added so much, we have failed on one of our additional design principles for goals. 
So being super focused in the beginning, it's like what, they, what, what were they looking for? Better performance, they wanted things to go faster so that they were delivering exp um, environments um, to, their, to their employees faster. Um, developers could deploy faster, like automation, and then the ability to scale on demand, scale up and down on demand, which made them look at other technologies, um, and then just greater flexibility. Being able to go through those step by step, and then not biting off all of the entire CNCF ecosystem, <laughs> that slide with all the logos at one time, but phasing that in allowed them to adjust um, and, go, uh, and go along the way. Now that they've gone, they're at like stage four where they're adding in things like service mesh and some other more advanced technologies. Now that they're there on the core platform, what they're now doing is, hey, now let's now look at these other two apps and bring them into the fold. So I think one of the things with um, you know, the, the business case is like being really clear and crisp on what are the outcomes that you're looking for putting that out and mapping that back to how does that deliver back to the organization. Um, the app that was selected here in the first phase was their primary retail management app. This was the app that all of their stores used as well as the partners who sold their products. This was the configurator for a customer to, to say like, I would like this thing in this color, um, this, um, this fabric, this blah, blah, blah. It was the customizer tool for the, for the um, product that they sold. Um, they were able to kind of optimize that. Um, and then, you know, they can show value um, related to that app, you know, harden what they're doing on the platform, optimize that. And then now they're going back and adding more apps. So I think the big thing is being iterative, focused and then being iterative to show incremental value over time. Right. Thanks, thanks, Betty. I want to ask a common question to uh, all these folks. When we talk about developers and on different platforms, when you hire a new developer, how long does he take to become productive? What I have found in a lot of cases, you, you, you need a lot of time to educate them, to you know, get them up, up to speed, uh, uh, training them. You know, some companies take months before a developer can get a single line of code. The difference which I find about cloud native is what Chris Rosen talked about earlier, is you have enforced security. That you can bring in a brand new computer science graduate, bring, put him online and say, hey, start writing code or start doing it. He's not going to be able to break the system. There is a lot of enforcements done. One of the ways I feel that you can communicate to your you know, uh, business users is, I can get a developer productive so much faster. They can do work so much faster. I want each of the panel to say, you know, what are you seeing in the market? Is that a business value that you can see from a cloud native solution of developer productivity? And we can then relate it to other things in that. Who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, um, I want to say like developer productivity and um, this concept of path to production. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's a lot of conversations that we have with companies today because if you talk about onboarding time, even an experienced developer, let's say onboarding at a new company, onboarding into a new project, how long before they get the environment? How long does it take them to figure out, like, you know, get all, you know, what are all the APIs, the, where's the code bases, all the things that they need to work on if it's a new team? Um, I'd say, like, that is a, that is a keen thing that has um, been, been really a hot topic, and you can see it by, like, how packed BackstageCon was. Um, as a day zero event here, um, the, the community is really kind of gravitating towards like this whole concept of can we have this internal developer portal that has everything that we can put like um, the application catalogs, APIs, and like can we use that as a way to also build in some guardrails so that anyone, um, even someone you just hired, so it could be a, you know, New college grad, we have some customers talking about I want to have new college grads start and I want them to be productive much faster. Can they also get their environment with all the right guardrails mm -hmm. built in, provisioned much faster? Because the more time they spend waiting is the more time we can't ship a new feature. And what if our competitor ships a feature? If it takes us months or a year, what does that mean for us from, you know, uh, loss of revenue potentially? Chris? Rosen? Yeah, I agree. So I think that's definitely the focus is around the return on investment of our scarce resources, which in this case are, are humans that we need to develop and innovate. And I think one of the ways that we've seen is an abstraction from the underlying technology that enables that. So whether you're running, you know, on 
OpenShift or Tanzu or whatever, that the developers aren't really interacting there. Because reality, and we all acknowledge this, that Kubernetes is hard. So building that shim, the proxy to the developer where they engage in tools, you know, whether it's GitHub, GitLab, whatever your developer tools are, those things are consistent. That's my one place where I interact. And it's that tooling, the pipelines, that integrate with the other things, the you know, security and compliance checking tools, the provisioning tools. All of those things are abstracted from me as a developer and that's what allows them to move faster because they don't need to learn all of the nuances of company A versus company B versus you know, project C and, and so on and so forth. So that's really the, the premise of acceleration. Great. Chris Rodney, any comments? Yeah, I think we are in violent agreement, but the, uh, just, one, just one point I wanted to make is, uh, I mean, Cloud Native has won. It's, it's not clear to me that there are really any other um, alternatives out there that, that are, so everybody's using Cloud Native stuff, and, and, and most people that go forward pick some flavor of it. But then if you just go one layer above it, exa exactly what are the integration stories around it? Do you actually get these services? Can an organization actually provision clusters on demand for engineers, or do they have to go through a process? That, that still hasn't quite settled. Um, there's a wide variety of uh, approaches to it. Some are very old school. You know, you go through an IT department for your development cluster, and that's today still happening in some places. And some are, you know, self-service and very, very dynamic. But there's a huge variance within the cloud native community on, on these approaches, especially at the enterprise level. And I think that's really the challenge to, to change so that those developers can, can actually be productive. It's one thing to know the tools and know the environments, but do they actually get the... Uh, uh, kind of the infrastructure to be really productive. That's, that's really the, the challenge in enterprise space. So going to Betty, you brought up the retail example that's still up there. What was the cost of downtime? Because one of the things that if you talk about the business value and you say, hey, with this cloud native solution, we can reduce downtime. But can you relate that to what is the, would have been the cost of downtime if that retail store had that? Experience. Yeah, um, they actually had an interesting um, thing. They're, they're like, when it came to rolling out any upgrades or you know changes to the application, it required downtime. But they're like, hey, this app is for all of our US stores. So luckily, there's a period in which the stores are always, all stores are closed. So they're rolling it there. Um, the risk was they didn't they didn't quite calculate like the cost of downtime, but 99% of retail sales run through this application. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge risk. Right, so it's not only for their stores, but it's also for any of their partners in which um, are, are selling their merchandise. Um, but the thing was, they're like, it was so inflexible. So the fact that like we wanted to add more functionality, but we were fundamentally unable to because just doing that is so cumbersome. Because you know, it's not only just the the um, the architecture of that; it was monolithic. So they're like, it it was just hard every time. We wanted to make one change. It would take so long before we could do all the mm -hmm. testing and get it out there. Um, but it was had a cascading effect. And so that, I mean, the change was just not happening. Meanwhile, the business is growing. Like they had acquired other companies um, and expanded their portfolio. And they wanted to kind of bring that into the fold, but they couldn't because architecturally their hands were tied. Great. So Chris Rosen, you brought up uh, the talk about claim processing in, in your example. How was the you know, claim processing speeded up? Because that's very important to the business user. You know, can we speed up that process that will give, drive bottom line value to that customer? Exactly, yeah. So in this, our example, it was you know, ultimately about claims and how quickly they can get from initial request to processing and closing it out. Because at the end of the day, that's what their KPI was around the time from onset to conclusion. And, you know, the way that they built in the automation in the lifecycle management, that helped drive that total period in which they were closing and shipping those. Because, you know, the reality is we're dealing with hardware and software. So we're going to deal with bugs and outages and things like that that happen. So building in resiliency and those operational characteristics to the services, to the applications that we're building, improve reliability and availability. Now, 
when they do detect the bug, because everything is automated, and instead of, you know, we've all been there where it takes weeks or longer to get something through QA, ultimately rolled out into production. Now with the tooling in place and the automation, they can do so much, much faster. And when those bugs and those issues are identified, go through, develop a fix, and roll that through their automated change management process. And that then improves the efficiency on that, the end-to-end -end claims process. Because that's really what they care about. You know, they assume the technology is there, the capacity is there, all of the elasticity that they need to run these cloud native applications. To them, it's really, can we handle and make, keep our customers happy because we all fear, you know, NPS scores and getting a bad rating. So they're also focused on that and driving the customer experience. Great, thanks, thanks. Uh, so question for Chris um, Flotner about your story. What kind of new applications were, you know, being able to be done in this situation? And what kind of actually bottom line business value did it, you know, drive for this use case you talked about? So in, uh, one of the things that surprised me was that uh, born in the cloud companies actually go through digital transformations as well. It's not just kind of established large companies that move from an on-prem to the cloud, or, uh, uh, but it's also companies that have always started on the cloud, but now they've actually reached enough maturity that to have to re-engineer the foundations of their, uh, um, of their uh, technology stack. And that's often, as the, pre, the panelists also said earlier, it's driven by a couple of key metrics. For example, how much are they spending on the cloud? And, and what they expect as a result of a transformation is an ability to, be, to save money and become more flexible about when, where, and, and how they deploy. And in our case, we actually address these uh, multiple layers. So there's a foundation layer that you need to put in place to be able to transform business to adopt the cloud native technologies, which then in turn enables a much more flexible application development cycle than the, what they're used to. So there are multiple layers of this transformation. And at the end of the day, a lot of the times it's about some level of cost savings and flexibility that they gain at the application deployments. Okay, I'm going to ask one, la one more question to the panelists and then I would like the audience to you know, ask you questions. You guys all talked about automation, especially Betty and Chris Rosen, you, know, you talked. So I want to understand the business value of automation. Uh, the way I look at automation is if I have a capability of taking an application and automating the complete way to go and get into production, I can build a one-time application faster. I can put it on the public cloud. I can put it on the private cloud. I can do that. That's For me, it gets you that business value of being able to respond to sudden market changes. Can you articulate in either your use cases that you already spoke about or some other use cases that where does automation drive bottom line business value to the, to the customer? I think the biggest driver is just around consistency. So we have different use cases where data sovereignty or latency or these different concerns come into place where I need to run an instance in a given country or in this particular data center or in this region. So if we've automated the development pipeline in that automate everything through infrastructure as code from deploying my resources to deploying applications to standing up software-defined storage. If all of that's automated, it's consistent. So we're, we're saving that time and resource. We are reducing human error. It allows us to deploy those applications consistently in the different environments. So it really drives home the repeatability, the consistency, the uh, building in the security checks and ensuring that we don't have rogue people. We don't want Chris Rosen pushing code to, you know, IBM Cloud. That's not the move we want. So we've got the right controls in place so that way everything is auditable. It's fully enforceable. We can control who has what level of access. And that's where the value comes in. And that's going to vary for each customer in each of their unique situation because everyone has a different starting point. If I'm running completely in monolithic apps today and I go through and I refactor to cloud native, 
that's going to be a different return on the investment compared to someone that was already, like Chris said, born on the cloud. I embrace containers and serverless, but now I'm focusing on the automation and the consistency that's going to come with it. So, you know, we spend a lot of time working with customers, meeting them where they are to understand where you are in your journey, and then let's help accelerate that to get you to the fully automated end goal. Yeah, and I think with um, automation also, it's a what you know well, um, you want to, uh, and then those are the things that you can then define and standardize. I think that's the thing, because if you want to go into a mode of like self-service, right, uh, what you want to do is make sure that um, if you want people to be able to self-service environments, what you want to do is build in the right policies and the configuration. So it's not like at time of self-servicing, I, as a developer, I'm going to say like, ooh, what do I get? I can pick whatever I want because that's, that's not what you're going for, right? So it's really kind of defining those. For the uh, customer, um, what they had mapped out is when a developer is ready to like deploy their code, it was a nine-step manual process with lots of people involved. And they were like, that is hugely inefficient, prone to error. That's not going to get us to be a more agile organization. So what they wanted to do was automate the process so that it is the developer, all they need to do is check it in. And it's, it's going through all the steps. Automatically, the system is doing that. And the system can then spit out a report saying like, hey, something is, you know, something's not compliant. And then you're managing by exception versus making the everyday be the thing somebody has to handhold and just make sure that that handoff is physically complete and correct. Got it. Yeah. Chris. Uh, yes, and uh, the, the, the one, one aspect I would focus on just uh, next to the others that uh, were mentioned is, is actually know-how and encapsulating know-how. The, you know, if you look at the cloud native space, it's actually fairly large and not every engineer is as adept at Kafka as they would be at the service mesh versus CI CD pipelines, whatever it is. And encapsulating that know how, making it reusable, making it automated is key. And I think that's that's one aspect that, that's really important. Great. Um, that's a really so great I, point. I'd like to sorry. No, I was saying? gonna say that's a really great point because then you're finally also scaling the expertise of a few people right. by automating that into your larger operating model. Got it. So I'd like to open it up to the audience for any questions. And uh, while we do that, I can also put up the QR code for some feedback or you know, rate this session. Any questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead. So uh, the, you, can you repeat the question? If you... Yeah, so the question is, um, in different customers, have we seen that the organization within that customer impacts their ability to adopt uh, DevOps cloud native? And, and I chuckle because the answer is absolutely yes. It's generally more of a cultural shift to embrace it than it is a technology challenge. And, and honestly, that's the biggest hurdle is people get stuck in this is how I've done it. This is how we've always done it. And we have to step back and say, you know, let's not take this personally, but maybe that's not working optimally for you, what you're trying to accomplish. So thinking about how to really embrace and break down internal silos between our old IT world and our, we had a server team, we had a storage team, a network team, to really break down those barriers to embrace change, embrace DevOps. I, Exactly, exactly. It really requires buy-in. And, and the thing that I like that Betty said um, when she was introducing her use case was, and this is the key to success, is start small. Pick one project, one team that's willing to be an innovator and try something, and then stand them up as the gold standard, and success breeds success. When another team sees that this team is being so successful and they're pushing out 20 times a day, they want to embrace that and be able to accelerate and innovate at the same pace. I just want to yep. bring up something about organizational structure. If, for those who have seen the history of Amazon, they came up with their web services back up in 2008. 
However, their journey really started in 2002 or 2003 when the CEO came and said, everything is going to be API driven. So the whole company was built on an SOA architecture starting in 2002 till they came up with their first product fully API driven in 2006 or 2008. That's kind of the change you have. And then the way Chris said, uh, Chris Rosen just brought up, where you get one team, when, you, when, when Salesforce started getting adopted for CRM, some folks saying, hey, why is this sales guy doing so well? Oh, he's using this cloud CRM and he's much more effective than the rest of us. So everybody started adopting that because they see success on one side. So Betty, go ahead. Oh, so I was gonna say, we, um, what's interesting is if I look back from my time, you know, in the early days of containerization at Docker to like what I'm seeing now is back then they were called like innovation teams. You had this, you had this team that kind of went out to like figure out what is all this stuff, right? They were exper experimenting in cloud, they were playing around with containers, they were kind of pushing the vendors to understand and then they were like, okay, let's figure out someone who can be a candidate at um, in the organization to, you know, be the first sample person to, you know, play with, get something onto the platform. Now it's, I feel like it's become a little more mainstream. I see this sometimes living in um, those who own the cloud strategy. Like if you're making decisions on cloud, you're also making decisions on cloud native. And then also seeing things like platform teams. But there is a bit of like, it's a separate group kind of, but they're looking at things holistically. So it's not just the tech, but the practices. They're different than the current model, uh, the institutionalized model, and then they're also the ones like, they're responsible for onboarding the apps and the app teams onto them. Any other questions from the audience? Raise your hand, shout it out. Okay, if that's the thing, I'm gonna ask the panelists, where do you see the future of cloud native going and, and adding value to businesses? Is there any particular industry you might see or anything with multi-cloud or edge or something that you see that is going to be driving additional value in the next, you know, maybe three to five years with cloud native technologies? And that'll be how we'll end our session. Is that okay? Who wants to go first? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I kind of see all these technologies rolling out very, very widely. The uh, I think the edge is a very exciting place where it is is greatly influenced by the uh, uh, cloud native technologies. I mean, there was already an edge kind of evolution about a decade ago, but it partially fizzled out because the the technology stack was not really in place. And I think the cloud native stack actually provides a new um, high quality foundation to kind of redesign how the edge works. But that's just one example. I think the same thing is happening in, in various other industries. Betty? Um, what I'm seeing right now is um, starting off as like uh, on the developer tool side of the front. Mm. Um, because I think as Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes has gotten pretty mature, but what the, the ecosystem around it has really been around, I think, innovating at the infrastructure surrounding Kubernetes. Like how do we do all that stuff there for, us, for our runtime and management? And now we're like, oh, right, this is really kind of complicated to throw a developer just right at it. So that's where I'm seeing a lot of stuff. Um, the, I mean, we're big into backstage and that's in the last two years gotten a lot of traction, but I'm seeing so many new startups just in the whole space for like that whole developer experience side, all of that in front of Kubernetes. So I expect that to just get, um, that could get become very specific to certain types of apps, you know, like, um, you know, we, I don't think we've even gone real deep in all the ML and AI stuff, but I see that as a whole area. Yeah, yeah. got it. Chris? Yeah, the other, I would just broadly say, I think the direction is going around usability and really focused on the user experience of consuming these technologies. When you think about when a new project comes out, and I'll, I'll pick on Istio as an example, uh, when that became an open source project, it was very powerful. There were a lot of things that you could do with it, but docs were a little lagging, the usability was a little bit behind. So they really had to focus in, as a community to improve those areas, to be able to bring that technology to mainstream, else you're really limited to a few outliers. So I think the whole cloud native space is focused on streamlining the usability, building the dev tools, taking that to the edge, and making all of that more consumable, more secure for those users. Great, with that, give a hand to our panelists. And uh, thank you for...
Thank you for attending. If you want to you know, rate this session, it would be great for us to get feedback for the next session. And uh, for those who are really interested in Edge, we had a session earlier today, and you can watch the recording of that. We, you know, uh, Chris brought up that Edge was popular. for this. So if you want to deep dive into that, that's an earlier session. Thank you.